Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really happy to have with me for the first time Mark Chandler. Mark joined Brown Brothers Harriman in October 2005 as the global head of currency strategy, and he's been with them, still with them, and uh, a very prominent person on Wall Street. I see him frequently uh, on uh, various places like... Uh, like Bloomberg and uh, CNBC, and he's been published in places like the Financial Times, Barron's, Euro Money, Corporate Finance, and Foreign Affairs. Most of you probably have seen him one time or another on television. Um, he's written a book in 2009. He wrote uh, his first book was Making Sense of the Dollar. It was published by Bloomberg Press. Uh, but we want to talk to him today about his most recent book titled Political Economy of Tomorrow, That was published, uh, well, just recently. It's uh, on the market now. So welcome, Mark, and thanks for joining me. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. You know, I've watched you many times on television. I've listened to you on Bloomberg, Thomas Keene in the morning and the like, and this is the first time that I've really had a chance to meet up with you uh, personally. Uh, You and I talked, uh, I guess, a couple of weeks ago on the phone, but it's really a pleasure having you. Uh, It seems, uh, if I understand, it was, uh, I believe, a dedication in your book. You said, those who know we can... Uh, that it's dedicated to those who know we can build a better world for more people because scarcity has been conquered, end of quote. Now, my first thought when I read that quote is, um, sure, for the perspective, or from the perspective of, say, the top 1% of the population in the Western world, it may seem like scarcity has indeed been conquered. And even if you go down to the top 10% of America's population, where I believe Mrs. Taylor and I probably fit in, we can say that uh, you know all our basic needs, and indeed a lot more than that, have been met for sure. But this is a time of income disparity in, in the United States. I, I think some have argued, like probably like no time before since the robber baron days of the 1920s. So even uh, America's middle class now is being many of the middle class is being shoved down into the poverty levels. Uh, so it seems to me that um, for yourself and maybe others that are you know on Wall Street who are doing very very well. Scarcity seems like a thing of the past, uh, but how about it for, for most of us? I mean, for most people, uh, it doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, on some hand, I'd say that I, I am painfully aware of the disparity of income and wealth, and that's mm-hmm. what most people tend to focus on. And I don't want to minimize that, but I, I think partly I would say that there's a lot less disparity in terms of consumption. You think of the penetration rate of things that we take, we would take for granted today that our grandparents, our great-grandparents couldn't even dream of. Indoor plumbing. Yeah. Water that, now leaving aside Flint, Michigan, some other places in the U.S., maybe some other places in, in uh, high-income countries. We can turn on a water spigot and not get sick. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have uh, uh, central heat. Uh, it's just amazing the things that we have, and, and proof of this is that not only rich people, but poor people are living longer. Mm-hmm. We've conquered many diseases. Now, I know there's some problems with diabetes coming back in the United States with our addiction to sugar, uh, but uh, I'd say that in general, uh, the trend has been towards people living longer, greater quality of life, and the kind of surplus that I'm talking about is that Earlier generations, think of what our grandparents had to do, six days a week, 12-hour days. The problem in the United States right now is that we, it might be that we, are work, that we are working. The average work week is only about 34 hours right now, mm-hmm. average work week. And so for me, the kind of surplus, I and mean, so for me, the problem is not one of production. We don't know how to produce enough things before. For instance, a large percentage of British men who volunteered for World War I, we rejected because they suffered from malnutrition. Uh. We do not suffer as a people, even when Lula was elected in Brazil. He was struck, he was like, I remember this, he was struck by the fact that he thought that his country didn't have enough food. And he found out that the problem was not enough food, but obesity was bigger <laughs> than, than starvation. And I'm, malnutrition, like eating the wrong foods, that's a different problem. So I'm, so I, so I wanted, I, so for me, I wanted like the, the surplus I'm talking about is that we can produce more goods than we know what to do with. We can mm-hmm. produce more food than we know what to do with. That's why I'm struck with in the U.S. and in Britain, we waste half the food we get between no. the farm, the grocery store, and the family. And I'm guilty of it as well. I, I buy a loaf of bread on a weekend. I eat a couple of sandwiches. The family eats a few sandwiches, some toast. And the week comes, we still have half a loaf left, and we say, "No, oh, time to get a fresh loaf." 
Yeah. So the, I think a lot of the surplus I'm talking about, we take for granted as all around us. Advertisement. Uh, to think about what our, what our grandmothers might have done making quilts. That is taking fabric that is no use for anybody, scrap and sewing the scraps together. Things like that we don't, we don't even, most people don't have to do anymore. But you're right, there still are a large number of people in the world who are living on $2 a day or less. Yeah. yeah I was just thinking, I, I noticed I have a pair of socks, a hole in the heel. And uh, in the old days, uh, going back to the 1950s, my mother might have tried to sew that together, preserve the socks. I just toss them and go buy another pair. So uh, is, I, your point is well taken. Uh, certainly, though, uh, what's happening is it's changing the way we're living our lives tremendously. This comes out very clearly in your book. And it is creating probably social tensions and problems. I mean, if you have fewer people working or people are working less, they're maybe not feeling as if they're worthwhile. Is that an issue that's, that's, that's coming about? Well, I think you do have, I, I know this is a problem in the U.S., but we have a large number of people. Uh, I think it was the Department of Labor had estimated 40% of the recent college graduates have jobs that don't require a college education for it. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I think about the large number of custodial engineers that have college degrees in New York. I have a brother-in-law who didn't go to college. He's an auto mechanic. But because of the incredible, uh, you know, there's more computer chips in a car that, yeah. than, la- than were in the lunar module that landed on the moon back in 69. <laughs> okay. and so my, my brother-in-law, he needs to become a computer expert to fix cars, something that, sure. you know, you, know you, you can't just be a grease monkey anymore. Right. And so he's learning that. He's adapting to that probably. And that's what, yes. that's what people need to do. Exactly. I think that uh, I think Joseph Stiglitz, he's got the Nobel Prize in economics several years ago, teaches up at Columbia, and he said, we always knew that free trade produced winners and losers. He said, but we just assumed that the winners would compensate the losers. And I think that is the problem. The people are getting squeezed by the changing, and our society is changing so rapidly. The people who are getting squeezed by that change are not being assisted by the people who are coming out on top of that system. To me, that's the problem. It's not that the, it's not that the system's changing. It's that we're not doing we're, we're we're not as empathetic of a society as we might have been before. What you're essentially, if I'm understanding your thesis, is that uh, our problem the problem of capitalism isn't uh, isn't a shortage; it's a surplus. Uh, and you point out that you know tech not technological breakthroughs allow more productivity uh, per per man hour. Uh, yeah, which which has allowed all of us to live better, no question about it. I mean, uh, you know, I, I was I think we, my wife and I were watching a movie about India over the weekend, and the abject poverty in some areas of India. Just you know, as you say, Americans aren't, and even Brazilians aren't going hungry. They're, you know, we have well more than we have to have, and yet there seems to be a thirst for more. I can't remember Mark other than. I think you're old enough to remember the Vietnam days. I certainly am. And I, I can't remember of a time when there was more sort of class consternation, anger towards certain people, angry division in this country, as I feel now, despite the fact, as you point out, that capitalism has served us so well, that, we've, that we have so much excess. What, what do you think is going on here? Why is that the case now? Yeah, I think that what's changing is that mobility is more difficult. So, for example, I am the first one in my family to go to college. Mm -hmm. My father was a plumber. My hands only get dirty these days if I get ink from the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal. (laughs) Now, the thing is, though, about it is that my son is going to go to college now, and college degree will not guarantee him a middle-class, a stable middle-class income or middle-class, like, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem, is that uh, uh, the, the, the movement between classes. For me, uh, 50 years ago, 45 years ago, getting to, uh, get, going to college was a way to uh, rise my living standards. But my son, even if he goes to college, and even if he gets his bachelor's degree, he's not going to necessarily move up in class rate. He's not going to become, he's not going to become wealthier. Mm-hmm. And, and this is true of an increasing number of people who go to college. So, so college is not the key thing anymore. And I think that the other thing that's happening is that the, the people who used to be winning, that is people who look like me, white men, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. are now not winning so much anymore. And in fact, mm-hmm. I'm just reading an article that says because of the uh, opiate uh, problem that we have, that white middle, cl- white middle class, middle-aged men 
are dying at a, at a younger age than my, many minorities. Yeah. So the white man who used to be privileged in America, for, and, it's, and I'm not saying that he's not anymore, but less so than before. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is, I think, when you look at, like, uh, for example, both in the U.K. vote for Brexit and the U.S. election of Trump, the key, and it looks like also, I'm just looking at some of the demographic data for the uh, Macron victory in France, but mm-hmm. it looks like that the key variable is education, mm-hmm. more so than income. And so what happens then is that as people find out that their education is not guaranteeing them the better lifestyle, it scares them. And I think that you're right. There's this class angst, economic mm-hmm. insecurity, despite low, low, relatively low levels of unemployment, despite an economy that still seems to be chugging along, people are very economically insecure, not just for themselves. But I think this, I think, is the key point in the U.S. right now. Up until yeah. now, the, the next generation has been able to live better than the parents. The generation now, say, say since 1980, uh, born in 1980, by the time they're 30, in 2010, they, only half of them were richer than their parents. While if you were born in 1940, by the time you were 30 years old, 95% of Americans were richer than their parents. That is the problem. The, next gen- the American dream, a house, car, children who have an education, is out of the reach mm. of many Americans. Yeah, it certainly seems to be the case. Um, you know, it's a paradox, isn't it? I mean, the, the capitalism, its weakness is its strength in a sense. That it, uh, it as you point out, um, capitalism builds and, and those at the top get richer and richer. And uh, you, you have more capital formation uh, that is good up to a point. But then as you point out, things change. Um, you talk in your book about, well, you call it, the Bretton Woods cash register and the Reagan, the Reagan Thatcher cash register periods. Uh, talk to us about those, about about those, about that concept, those concepts, and uh, and where are we today with regard to that? Yeah, sure. So uh, it turns out that there's a guy who works for the same bank that I work for now, Brown Brothers, uh, and in 1911, 1912, he was working for the working for the same bank, and he had a vision. Of what the tw- of what the, basically the 20th century was going to be like, and it was based on this idea. Because remember what happens uh, up until 1865, the U.S. is divided by the Civil War. After mm-hmm. the Civil War, the U.S. now has a national economy. The shoemaker in Boston is now competing with the shoe store in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Cohen's idea was, and this was popular, a common idea, late 18th century, I'm sorry, late 19th century, early 20th century. Just he called it capital congestion. When you have, if you have too much oil, we know what happens. If the, if the supply of oil exceeds the demand for it, the price falls. Same thing with pork. China has called it their, uh, their uh, swine herd, and the price of pork rises. Same thing with money. We have too much money, so what happens? The, the rate of profit falls, or interest rates fall. And this is what Conan, Conan's idea was. This was the problem. This was the problem of capitalism, and the solution for it is to trade, is to export, is to build a social safety net domestically. We do all these things. He envisioned these things. He, he, what he envisioned was very much like the open door, was very much like the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the general agreement to talk and talk, GATT, which, uh, you know, WTO, the predecessor. He had mm-hmm. this vision. And, this is, and so I think that what happened was the great war, wars interrupted this capital congestion. But... By uh, shortly after, say during the Bretton Woods era, the cash register—it's it, already the surplus is already beginning to build. Mm-hmm. And when that breaks down, it breaks down because of this, this too much capital. Mm-hmm. And, so, and, and the system, the political system, the social relations are too rigid. And so when it, the system collapses, it, it can only collapse in a crisis because no one's re- everybody's reluctant to give up the status quo. And so when the crisis comes, we don't know what's going to happen. But then Reagan and Thatcher, about a decade later, their vision is basically turning this Charles Cohen on its head. Rather than the U.S. export its surplus, Reagan and Thatcher's innovation would make, let the Anglo-American economies like the U.S., the U.K., and Australia have them run large trade deficits, absorb the world's surplus. But, of course, you know, when we absorb the world's surplus of goods, we have to import capital as well. Yeah. So the U.S., and for the most part, I mean, the U.S. just because it's so big, but the U.K., the rest of the Anglo, 
American uh, world was running trade deficits, current account deficits, absorbing the world surplus. Capital became uh, more mobile, became allowed to trade internationally. I mean, I think about the currency market, which is what I track closest. Yes. $5 trillion a day. We, hmm. it's, it's, uh, uh, this week, we will trade current turnover in the foreign exchange market will be enough to finance global trade for a year. Mm. And so what I think what happened then is Reagan and Thatch understood of a surplus capital, and they said, let, us, let the Anglo-American economies absorb it, but that's not going to be good enough. What are we going to do with it? So what we do is we create a huge financial superstructure. So instead of, because we don't need the money to produce goods, we take the capital out of the industry, take that industrial capital, and we put it in this realm of circulation, where it's buying, paper, buying and selling paper assets. Mm-hmm. What we found out in the great financial crisis was that surplus of capital that's moving around five trillion days in FX market, moving around bonds and bitcoins, all this money that's in circulation itself has a feedback loop, and that crisis or excesses there hits the real economy. And so now I, I would put us now in a period where we still are plagued by the surplus capital and so much surplus. Think about what the uh, countries do. Uh, if farmers in the U.S. grow too much corn or too much wheat, what happens? The government s- starts a program where they buy that surplus and they warehouse it. They keep it in a silo. Mm-hmm. Well, I suggest in the book that that is essentially what we, the central banks are doing with capital. We have too much capital, and so the, so the central banks buy it and they stick it into their vaults keeping the capital off the market, trying to push up prices of financial assets. And so uh, I, I think that we, so out of the ashes of the Bretton Woods system came Reagan-Thatcher. And now that the Reagan-Thatcher model, I think, ended with the great financial crisis, that represented like the logical end of that strategy, mm-hmm. now it's a bit lost. We, we're not sure what the next cash register is going to be. What is that model of accumulation that's going to allow the social classes to reproduce themselves. And by social classes reproducing themselves, I mean the middle class has to be secure. And capital has to be able to reproduce itself. Or if the classes can't reproduce themselves, and the reason I should say the reason that capital is not able to reproduce itself is because interest rates, the return on capital is too low. Right. There's already still about $7 trillion of bonds globally, negative interest rates. To me, uh, that's just like, it's still hard for me to like, get my head around it. Yeah. Negative interest rates. And not just, it's not just, we're not just talking about overnight money. We're talking about you want to lend money. You want, you're in Italy and you want to protect some of your savings so you're going to lend it to the government. They charge you like 50 basis points to lend them money for two years. Yeah. Insane. And so for me, yeah, so, for, yeah, so for me, this, this idea of this, uh, yeah, where we are now is that, uh, we've got this surplus capital still. We don't know what to do with it, but we don't have a, we don't, you know, when, uh, when Bretton Woods collapsed and Nixon announces, uh, Price controls. Mm-hmm. Little did we know that Reagan and Thatcher were about less than a decade away. And same thing now. We, we, I'm not smart enough to come up with the new cash register. But what I try to do in the book is identify certain things that's going to have, like m- women, like work and power, more feminized. And that means partly more networks, less hierarchies. I look at the relationship between employee and employers and see how that work relationship is changing. You know, when I, was, when I began my career, I just wanted to get into work before my boss did and leave as soon as his car pulled out of the driveway. <laughs> and uh, now I see people want to do things like work-life balance. I don't think Bill Gates or Henry Ford would have a clue what that means. Yeah. That's what the next, next people, this generation wants. And it's partly the influence of women uh, coming from the non-market economy and joining the market economy in huge numbers. And I also look at the state and citizens, and that lets me think about the basket of goods that we get as citizens, and what, what, what's our civic responsibility, what's our civic duty. I don't hear about those words anymore. I just hear about, I don't like to call them entitlements. I think those are the rights of citizenship, that basket of goods. But what do we, what do we have to do in exchange for that? In the U.S., I, it looks to me like the only thing you really have to do is hard to get out of jury duty. But mm-hmm. there's ways out of your taxes. Uh, uh, you don't have to. You, you don't have to be. You don't have to be serve a military time anymore. You don't even have to. Volu- you have to do any volunteer activity. And our civic society is has eroded. Yes, I agree with that. And how do we get that back? Because you, you, you know, um, if it's all just about what can I get out of the system without putting something back into it, uh, that's not a very healthy scenario, is it? 
No, but I think that uh, what happens is the U.S. has this non-statist way of doing things. So if you look at what uh, you look at what Americans give philanthropic activity. And it's not, I'm not just talking about rich people like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. I'm talking about the average person, how much they actually are giving to charities mm-hmm. or whatever their cause is. It, it's, it's quite remarkable. And so I wonder if the center, so the way the story I would tell is that in the uh, early part of the uh, 20th century, when more women uh, were not part of the market economy, it's not like they sat at home and watched soap operas. Yeah. They were building civic society. These organizations, PTAs, the uh, uh, Anti Cruelty Society. Uh, I think about all these uh, Jane Addams and Dorothy Day and these uh, uh, these these women who really built civic society. Now the women have to go to work because not just because they want to uh, sort of be affirmed as, as as people, but also because the household, the men's wages, no longer keeping pace with inflation or productivity. To make ends meet, the woman had to go to work. Instead of, we do a good job of turning vir- uh, turning necessities into virtues. Yeah. So I think that the, the center of a civic society now might not be the household. The household yeah. has been like has been emptied. I see this at, at where I work, but I see this at other large organizations. We have all kinds of all kinds of activities for people to volunteer, teach kids about reading, uh, make ba- ba- fill up backpacks for school supplies at the beginning of the semester, uh, 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 building homes. Uh, all kinds of things uh, of activities that the, that the employer organizes for the employees. Mm-hmm. Well, Mark, you certainly are, are giving us some optimism, some reasons to be optimistic. I, I think there's lots of questions that remain to be answered, and you're saying you don't have the answers for us in the book, but you certainly provide some great ideas and some things to think about unconventionally. Thank you for that. It's really appreciated. I would like to ask you, uh, well, we really don't have time, but just one, where's the dollar going now, Mark? You were, I mean, here we are. We're seeing the dollar breaking through 99, 97, 96 and change now. Uh, as the expert on foreign exchange, is king dollar going to remain king for a long time, or is it going to have some weakness here? Yes, yeah, so I think that we have seen some weakness in the last, uh, actually since the Federal Reserve hiked rates in the middle of March. And part of this is because of some problems we have in the U.S., partly because the news stream has gotten better in Europe. But if there's one word that still drives my bullish dollar view, it's divergence. And that is what we're going to see happen is that the Federal Reserve is likely to continue to raise interest rates uh, once or to- two more times this year, begin shrinking its balance sheet mm-hmm. well before the ECB can, can even stop buying assets or the Bank of Japan. They're still expanding their balance sheets. So I recognize that uh, the near-term outlook for the dollar it's probably a bit softer, though the downside momentum might be feeding a little bit. Uh, the problem right now for a lot of people is that the bad news continues to drip from uh, Washington. And yeah. it's not the news itself. But it's, what it really is, is what does this mean about the economic program, which was already, right, Mark, people already had questions about it and some legislative challenges. Thanks for being with us. It's, your ideas are great. 